Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, I have the pleasure to start the afternoon session after having a good lunch. And uh, I have another pleasure because I've been allowed to switch freely to my native language if English is too difficult for me to explain what uh, the message should be. So let me start, and it's quite easy for me uh, to have a good head start because Professor Spillman has set the stage. She told you what of, uh, of what immense importance the past of the human species still is and will remain in future to our present and to future measurements uh, concerning <coughs> violence in human society and to keep it at bay as it is of course necessary because uncontrolled violating aggression occurs quite often, too often in fact, among humans to be viewed only as a rare side effect of rage. And violence of individuals is largely controlled and condemned within, within societies, but it is vindicated in conflicts between groups. We have heard that. Humans as a biological species are extremely aggressive and prone to become violent. This may be simply viewed as our evolutionary burden. So let me start with a few remarks concerning the process of studying the problem from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist. The one point I would like to make is there are different systems and contexts of violence. Aggression can be directed towards non-human beings, the hunted, or towards members of the same species. The first case is inter-specific, the second one intra specific. That makes a big difference, of course. But if we look at the intraspecific aggression, there can be also different forms. Individuals within a group, the case from Munich, you have been introduced this morning, collective intergroup aggression, what we could call war, and these three forms have to be treated differently by human societies, of course. From an evolutionary biologist's point of view, one has to deal with some basic questions. The first one, the most important for our area of study, is the phenomenon, violence, unique to humans, and very likely only or mostly the outcome of psychosocial interactions, then it's not so good for evolutionary biologists to try to present some opinions. We should be very cautiously. But if somewhat similar or comparable in form and function occurs in the behavior of other related species, then it is a question of evolutionary biology and we have to look for the expressions and functions of violent behavior among other species, in our case among other primate species, more or less closely related to humans. And the second question is, because we know quite a lot about our closer relatives, why did violence become so prevalent in our human species? Human or non-human species 
if you look at it from the point of view of aggression. What has been the initial advantage to behave violently? And what triggered the breakthrough in the course of our speciation, from the pre-humans to early humans up to our own species? The persistence since ancient times into modern societies is well known. It is a good hope for us to state that the major proportion of the existing humanity tries at least to cope friendly with each other, but the proportion which is in fact in war, which is violently acting against other humans, is much too big to be neglected, of course. A short look to our relatives, the great apes, the orangutan, the gorilla, and the two species, the two species of chimpanzees. The chimpanzee in the narrower sense and the bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee. Which of these four species is the most violent and which one the most peaceful? You know the answer already. The chimp is the most violent species but it is as closely related to us as the bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee, which is the most peaceful species. So we have no direct evolutionary basis to say, since we only are better or more advanced chimpanzees, like Jared Diamond has it put in the title of his famous book, The Third Chimpanzee, the human species, and that's why we have to be so violently aggressive because it is our, our very old heritage from the chimpanzee line. That is not true. The bonobo chimpanzee is the most peaceful, acting in a way we could characterize as make love, not war. That's a typical behavior of the pygmy chimpanzee. The relatedness tells us, as I have strengthened already, quite little about the origin of our so aggressive form of living. With a distance of about 1.2% in genetical terms, we are as closely related to the pygmy chimpanzee, the most peaceful, as to the other chimpanzee form, the normal chimpanzee of the savannas. Let us have a short look onto the social structure of the chimpanzee group. The chimpanzee is a male-dominated, in-group, aggressive, and quite largely hierarchical structured society with a pronounced territorial defense and warlike intergroup aggressions with very destructive violence. The bonobo is quite the opposite. A female-dominated, peaceful, friendly society with very few aggressive encounters within the groups. So if we try to look for the reasons for intra- and inter-specific aggression in the chimpanzee, we can find some basic pattern, how it works. Male dominance is established by hard fights, enforced with coalitions with friends. You have to make friends in a chimp society to become a dominant male. It's not so far away from our own behavior. Signs of weakness trigger violent aggression within the group. And that's a very important point. If some individuals within the group 
show signs of weakness, we can be quite sure that the others hawk against them. They mob it and they try to expel it from the societies. There has been many such cases recorded in the field studies. And territorial expansion or shifts in territory also trigger conflicts with other groups, other groups which can be destructed completely by a behavior which must be called war because it is so similar to human warlike behavior that the behaviorists who studied the chimp behavior had no other choice than to take this word for characterizing the behavior. So we have in-group aggressiveness and intergroup or between group aggressions. Is now the problem solved? I think not at all. Why not? The bonobos are very closely related to the chimpanzees, still much closer than to us. Why are bonobo chimpanzees so peaceful and the normal chimpanzees so aggressive? Chance is not a good answer, of course. Chimpanzees show their brutal, brutal forms of violence against baboons, other primates, quite close to them in terms of behavior too, or forest antelopes, which could be viewed as forerunners of the game animals the human species is hunting up to today. The problem from an evolutionary point of view simply is to look for the differences of ultimate causes, deep-rooted forms of behavior and proximate expressions of this behavior. So the evolutionary question, what it is good for, have to work on two, in a, in a twofold manner. On the actual, the ecological stage of what is happening now and there, and on the long term, historical stage for what it has been good for once upon a time when this behavior established itself in the society. The proximate explanation says us clearly higher dominance results in more offsprings. It says us clearly. It is not at all so clear. We are now able to distinguish which individual has in fact been the father of this or that offspring. And it shows that not at all the most dominant male must be the most prominent individual in terms of propagation of having offspring. The ultimate causation is based on a quite different look onto the things which started to go on in millions of years ago in the African savannas. The living conditions of chimps of today and bonobos of today are quite different, very different. Bonobos, by and large, live in the tropical forests of Central Africa. The chimpanzees are savanna dwellings. They live more on the margins of the forests and not into the deep interior. What means this difference? Looking at the bonobo, 
we have a simple ecological fact. Tropical forests are not rich in protein. Protein, in fact, is scarce in tropical forests, generally all over the world. But it is evenly spread in space and time. There are no special seasons for getting protein-rich food at certain times. And on the other hand, special seasons of famine, of deficiencies of proteins. The dominance of bonobo females is based on the fact that they are deciding, deciding in our sense of calling it, when they are ready to be fertile. They have to wait to accumulate the resources necessary to be out an offspring. So sexual dominance doesn't make much sense in such a community where the females are the key for the reproduction of the group, even if there would be dominant males. The bonobo females, they are the key in this play. As we can call it, make love, not war, they are dealing with problems, with aggression, by pulling it down in strengths and intentions by sexual behavior, sexual behavior in the pleasure giving form and not in the form which results in reproduction. Males in such a society are completely uncertain about their paternity, but they are essential for the safety of the group of a whole. What means the difference? If we look onto the chimpanzee, in the savannas, the margins of the forests, food is unevenly spaced, sometimes in surplus, but over long periods, during the dry seasons, scarce. But that's a big difference. Protein-rich food can be gained by highly aggressive raids aimed at other primates or, as I only already stressed it, by raids on small antelopes. Chimps are facultative predators, we could call it. They are not really predators. They are not making their living on hunting, but they add some necessary amounts of animal protein to their diets by hunting, by active hunting. And thus is their behavior can thus change quite abruptly between peace, the peaceful chimps, as Jane Goodall encountered them and told us about the behavior of the chimpanzees, of the Gombe Stream Preservation Area in their marvelous books, and periods of horrifying behavior, which she at first couldn't understand what was happening by a warlike form of behavior. From our cousins to our roots, the human evolutionary line and that of the chimpanzees separated about five to six million years ago in the tropical African forest savanna border area. Man's earliest forerunners, the Australopithecid apes, became bipedal and extended their action in area from the forests or the margins of the forests into the savannas. Why did they do that and for which advantage? Let us have a short look onto this history of our own phylogenetic line. The southern apes, as a translation of the um, systematic terms, Australopithecinen uh, has it, have been dwellers of the 
savannas which formed at that time and extended more or less continuously also from Africa into the Near East and uh, far into Asia. The chimps in that period of time adapted, adapted to forest living. The common ancestors of both lines have been more close to humans than to chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are not the forerunners of us. They are a separate line which split of the human line six or seven million years ago. Why was it worthwhile to change behavior, move out into the savanna? One of the most convincing theories, and there is a number of theories in my view, is the availability of protein, of animal, of big animal protein in these savannas, which became richly populated by big animals like zebras or all the buffalo and antelope and gazellas we know from today and which have in fact been much richer in species millions of years ago. And if we look onto the demands which the bearing of a child sets onto the mothers, then we clearly have to state nutrition, the nutritional state of the body is decisive for the reproductional output. Protein, not carbohydrates, make babies. Or as we could call it simpler, and I use the German, nicht Bananen, sondern Fleisch macht babies. What's a difference? We can count it today even in a quantitative way. The amount of animal protein in the African savanna amounts up to 20 tons, metric tons per square kilometer. In the rainforests, in the African rainforests, there is a mere of a dozen kilograms or so of animal protein in the forests, potentially available. That's why chimpanzees of our days are angling for termites with much dedication and consume this so-called, even uh, also uh, wrongly so-called white ants with delicious in their faces. So this is the seasonal forests at the margins of the savannas transmit the richness of the forests into the direction of the, the poorness of the forests into the direction of the savanna by a very attractive seasonal sort of food which are riping sweets, riping fruits. We can see today how attractive fruit trees in the ripening season are to many animals and how even forest animals came out of the thickets of the woodlands to consume at certain times the sweet fruits. You see on this graph the big difference why it was good for the first trials, I said, got a head start to use the protein-rich savanna as a new habitat for living. And that gives us an interesting link to our aggressive behavior and the problems with this high aggression. Meat especially mounds of meat, are worth fighting violently if protein, if animal protein is in short supply for reproduction. And this is the case in the tropical forests. Bipedal locomotion, it characterizes humans as 
nomads of a nomadic species, which can follow more or less continuously the wandering prey species, the big grazing animals, is a very decisive trait of our own being. We are the only, the only wandering primates. And even in the English language, a German word for that is used, Wanderlust. Wanderlust steckt in unseren Genen, könnte man sagen. Wanderlust is in our genes. A severe competition for a meat, which was quite likely from the start on, enforced both in-group and between-group aggression, as well as by killing interspecific violence in the process of slaughtering animals. We have heard about that this morning. The result was the emergence of a wolf-like society in which in-group violence, which would weaken the state of the group, the group's performance, became restricted, more or less, into a ritualized, non-destructive form, and the establishment of a somewhat lasting, nearly stable dominance hierarchy. Between group violence, on the other hand, could improve the success of the own group. The separation of groups into the hostile others, which are against us, a principle that is still working, is something comparable to the process of speciation. The human species behaves as if it is on the way to split up into an array of separate species. Well, we could it put in the other hand, we try to become different from each other. This was enforced by cultural differentiation. Culture separates, as we all know. The others which don't share our culture and to some degree the genetic inheritance can be identified much better by cultural traits and language, of course, than in terms of their genetic relatedness. We can hear in the first words where people come from. We have the feeling they are more distant to us or less distant if we are talking to each other. So language enforces separation. It hides our in-group knowledge, our familiar history and intentions because only the members of our group know the meaning of the words and get the message. Language can much more efficiently separate people than any other form of differentiation. And religion is the next force which multiplies this enforcement by the process of rebonding, religio in Latin, which means that is we. We are the bearer of the right way of thinking and living, and these are the others. And in the process of becoming the others, they are separated from the human race, and they are on the way or became already other animals, which can be hunted, hunted down like an animal, because they are not human beings like us. Well, the conclusion of the evolutionary model is not quite, quite good for our own understanding. Latent, low-level violence, as seen at times among chimpanzees, became a central factor in early human evolution during the change 
from low quality plant food to meat. As a result, human fertility surpassed that of the chimps by the fourfold at least. This is an evolutionary success. The intergroup violence, wars, became firmly anchored as a necessity for survival from the, old, from the oldest times to the very recent times. And they are now an evolutionary burden. Language and religion act as a means of separation of cultures in a process very similar to the origin of species. Individual eruptions of violence had been channelized into group aggression, turned to the outside by creating warriors for the sake of the group at first, and not soldiers we are fighting for soldi, for money. Bad in-group violence became transformed into good service because the animals, the efforts, no longer were considered as members of their own species. So the old question arises again, is violence inherited or learned? Part of the answer, of course, is hidden in the biblical comment. Thou must not kill. If there would be no inclination to kill, no basic genetical burden, such a command would never have been necessary. From the earliest beginning of human evolution to the recent past, several other human hominid I should be more precise, species existed, but only a single one survived. We know that from the fossils, Homo sapiens. We have good reasons to assume that the other hominid species have been exterminated, as it has been the case with many cultures, with genocide and cultural destruction of people even up to recent times. Social and political checks and balances were and are not strong enough to prevent violent aggression. This is of course not new, but simply a statement. So what to do with the situation? I won't give an answer or, and I cannot give an answer. It wasn't, wasn't my task in presenting this uh, lecture. But we can sum up with some points of view. Three different strategies are necessary at any time and you for coping with the three different forms of violence. The in-group, individual-based violence, which has been fighted against by social measurements by family. We have heard this this morning. And we know that. Between groups, intraspecific violence has to be set, uh, kept at bay by cultural methods. Very difficult task, in fact, but not improbable to achieve that. Interspecific violence against other beings and nature as a whole is a task for global ethics that will last very long, as we know, to achieve or even to approach such a goal. I thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me. Thank you.